questions. So um, as Nick said, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a scientist. What I'm gonna try and talk about is how these things work, these things being brain and modern AI systems. And at the end, uh, we can talk a bit about the, you know, the philosophical implications of that. I'm gonna sneak in a reference to two philosophy books um, just because of the venue. Um, but but let's let's start with something that um, us neuroscientists take for granted, but probably most even most people in the room uh, don't. Uh, and this was given a, a great name uh, by Francis Crick, uh, the uh, biologist who later called uh, the astonishing hypothesis. This is something that we tend to take for granted and forget that other people don't. Um, and he, he put it like this. Um, you, your joys and sorrows, your memories, ambitions, your sense of identity and free will, are in fact, no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have put it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. Everything about you, your consciousness, all of this is produced by the matter inside your head. This is um, an assumption that we have to make in order to study the brain. And it's easy for us to forget that probably a lot of people, uh, even in this room, don't, uh, don't feel like this. In fact, uh, could, could I ask actually, how many people, if you could raise your hand, if you actually do believe this? And, and raise your hand if you don't believe this. Okay, so I mean, everyone. But it's worth remembering that this is, is an alien idea to most people, but for today, we're gonna have to take it for granted and we'll see maybe some of the things we see might, might make you uh, uh, think about this. Um, so what are neurons? Neurons are the cells that the brain is made from. This is one uh, on the left here. It's swimming around in a, in a dish and it looks like an amoeba because it basically is like an amoeba. All of the cells in your body have the same computational power as an amoeba, which is actually a lot because an amoeba is something that can live in a pond, get food, reproduce, fight off predators, live a whole life all by itself. 10 billion of these are cells with the same amount of computational power living in your head. So you are the product of 10 billion cells like an amoeba all operating together. On the right, what you see is what the brain cells do when you're in the womb. So you can see that they're, they stop crawling around. That's what they do at first. Then they settle down. But once they've settled down, this is while you're in the womb, the brain cells extend these little wires called axons and dendrites which then go make connections with each other. So they're like the logic gates in a computer. They grow these connections that then talk to each other. Uh, and, and that's what enables uh, the, the computations uh, in your brain to happen. So, so what neurons do, these fundamental cells of the brain, um, is they process their inputs and produce an output. So this is a picture of a neuron. Um, over here, you've got the, the main part of it, the cell body. And these things growing out of the cell body are called dendrites. That's where the inputs come in. So there's other cells in the brain that send their uh, outputs to this, uh, this cell. They, they touch on these uh, parts that are called the uh, dendrite. Um, someone, could you mute, please, if you're online? Um, Okay, and then the, the, the neuron integrates all of these uh, inputs. It basically adds them together uh, and produces an output, one output. And the time scale it does that is of the order of 10 milliseconds, so 100 times a second. By this is a snail's pace. Computers operate around a, a million times faster. They can do something like 10 billion operations per second. This can do 100 operations per second. It's incredibly so but still powerful. And so it integrates these inputs and produces one output. Uh, and that output is then broadcast all over the brain where it hits around uh, 10,000 um, other, other cells 
receive the output, and then they add it together in another way. And all of these cells, by talking to each other, somehow produce the thoughts that are happening uh, in your head. This is what a neuron looks like when it's all grown up. The ones we saw in the movies were, were swimming around. It's a first thing they do, they find their place and they grow out their connections. Uh, and this is what they look like. This is inside a, the brain of a mouse. You can see here's a, a neuron in the a part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex of this mouse. Its dendrites are over here, they're localized. And then the output called the axon goes all around the brain. Uh, and, and so it has these 10,000 inputs, which are all in the same place. And one output that then spreads all over the brain. All right, so what do these neurons do? Well, they talk to each other uh, by using a, a code, which is a, a, a pulse code, so a series of clicks. These things are called action potentials. Sounds a bit like this. And you're actually going to hear one. What you're about to hear is uh, from a recording uh, made inside uh, the brain of a, of a human. This isn't done very often in humans. Because if you're going to put an electrode in there, you need a very good reason to do it for ethical reasons. So the only time really this can be done is in patients who are awaiting surgery for epilepsy. They have epilepsy that's intractable, can't be treated with drugs. The only solution is to cut out part of the brain. Uh, but the surgeon, of course, has to make sure they don't cut out the wrong part of the brain. So they need to put an electrode in there to measure the electric fields being produced so they know that they're cutting out the epileptic part. That means they've got these people sitting in the hospital for days on end with an electrode in their head waiting to have an epileptic fit. And while they're doing that, they're doing something else. And what they're doing is these experiments to try and understand how the brain works. So what you're gonna see is an experiment with the, the patient um, is watching a series of very short movie clips, one or two second movie clips. And you're gonna hear some clicks on top of it. That's the sound of one neuron giving out its pulse code. And you'll see that the, the neuron responds to uh, certain movies that the, the patient watches. And then we're gonna see later that same person rem remember what, you hear his voice, but his, his voice is gonna sound a bit odd. And it sounds odd because um, for, for confidentiality reasons, you can't hear the actual voice of the patient. So it's gonna sound like a computer talking, but it's actually a person put through a vocoder to dis uh, disguise their voice. All right, so let's listen. Okay, so the movie should start soon. Um, you can see uh, this this uh, that tells you how fast the neuron is firing. Yeah. Okay. What we just saw was that when the the system came on, this particular neuron in the brain suddenly became very active. Um, it's not responding to anything else. It doesn't know anything. Particularly like The Simpsons. Uh, you can see soon uh, it's going to go again. So let's watch that. came on, started uh, becoming active, pause this for a moment, uh, and, and it continued even after the symptoms went off. For a second or so later, while the person is still thinking about the symptoms, the neuron is still active. So now let's watch what happens when he is just being asked to recall 
uh, what he saw. Just name what were the different clips he saw, and we'll hear the neuron uh, as well as we do this. Oh. Remember, you can't hear his actual voice because uh, they blocked it out for confidentiality reasons. Okay, so what happened? As he's remembering, the cell isn't doing anything. Then suddenly the cell starts firing. It becomes active. It's making all of these clicks. Then a bit later, he says, the Simpsons. The cell continues to fire. He's laughing because he's thinking about the Simpsons. Eventually, the cell slowly tails off in its activity. Uh, and, and then it stops. So this is the cell that whenever you're watching The Simpsons or thinking about The Simpsons, this cell is active. It's really incredible that it was this simple. It really didn't need to be this simple. You could imagine that there wasn't a single cell for The Simpsons, uh, and presumably there's one for Marilyn Monroe, for Michael Jordan, for Martin Luther King, for all of these other things as well. But it didn't need to be this simple. But paradoxically, it actually really is this simple, that there are cells in your brain that are active when you're thinking about particular things like The Simpsons. So the question is, how does it get that way? So we're not born knowing about The Simpsons. How do we how do we develop these cells that can that can uh, respond to these abstract categories like people, like thoughts, like like philosophy? Uh, how we learn, and then how the cells in the brain change their connections uh, when, when we learn. So there's three types of learning, at least three types that we understand, um, which have the following names. There's supervised learning, which is when a person or an AI system is, is given an instruction that when you see a particular situation, you should behave a particular way. You're told what to do. The uh, example we'll see of this is, is Pavlov's dog. There's unsupervised learning, which is when you see something, something you haven't seen before, you grow to recognize it. So suppose you're wandering around the woods. a negative reward you might uh, get a smack for whatever reason uh, you, you get a positive or negative reinforcement so you learn to do this more or less often all right so let's think about how this happens in the brain so how do neurons learn uh, well neurons communicate uh, via synapses this is a oh. oh yeah there you go this is a picture of a synapse uh, so this is the output of one neuron, the axon, and these are the inputs of another one, the dendrites, and they're connected by this thing called the synapse. The synapse is where the electrical signal, and it turns into a chemical signal. When the electrical signal gets here, it releases a chemical called the neurotransmitter that then goes across uh, this tiny uh, cleft, uh, just nanometers uh, in size, uh, to, the, to the other side, 
uh, where there are receptors that detect the signal. And the thing about the synapses is that they can change their strength. They can get stronger or weaker. And when they do that, that's when you learn. At least this is what we think is learning happens when you have a change in the strength of these synapses. And we have a basic idea of how it works as well, which is that the synapses get stronger when the neurons on both sides of the synapse are active at the same time. So this one, the input, and that one, if they're active at the same time, so you've got one of those clicks produced by the Simpson cell and another uh, cell downstream of that, also active at the same time, the connection between them gets stronger. So let's see, how would this give you some sort of learning? So let's start with supervised learning. So the example of this that you read about is, is Pavlov's dog. It's a famous um, experiment in psychology over 100 years ago. It's the sort of thing that, you know, when you think about it, it's obvious it was going to be like this, but somebody actually needed to do it to, to, to give it a name. So Pavlov's dog, Ivan Pavlov, the, the Russian uh, psychologist with a big beard uh, and a dog, and he fed uh, his dog some dog food and the dog uh, salivates. Um, but if he rings a bell, the dog doesn't do anything. What does a dog know about a bell? Then by giving the dog some food and ringing a bell at the same time, the dog learns that the bell is associated with food. After which, just ringing the bell alone is enough to make the dog salivate. Um, could, could you mute please uh, online? Um, all right, so let's think about how neurons might do that. So here's a, a, a cartoon of how we think this works. So here's the neuron, uh, and here's its dendrites where the inputs come in. Here's the axon where the output goes out. And there's one input that's particularly strong. This input is strong enough to make the neuron fire all on its own. So when there's food, according to this hypothesis, this neuron, this very strong input is active. And that causes the neuron to be active, the one, uh, th this one. And that causes the, the dog to salivate because the salivation glands are downstream of here. When the bell rings, it activates these inputs that are originally very weak. And that's not enough to make the neuron active on its own. So the bell doesn't do anything on its own. But now, if you present them together, this strong input from the food is enough to make the neuron fire. So you get salivation. But the other thing is, because this one uh, on the input, sorry, this, th this one and this one were active at the same time, the input and output are active at the same time, we have this synaptic plasticity that causes these synapses to get stronger, right? And, and I've drawn it as them getting bigger because literally that's what happens. They literally get bigger when they get stronger. So now, this neuron now has strong inputs from the inputs that convey the bell, which when the bell sounds next time, these are enough to make the neuron fire and to make the dog salivate. Obviously, it's a very simplified story, but we really have quite a lot of evidence that this is how this sort of learning happens. This supervised learning, when you learn to associate one action with a particular uh, sensory circumstance. All right, the second type is unsupervised learning, which is spotting patterns. So uh, this is, is a quite a similar thing, but um, the difference is we don't have this strong input here. So imagine you've got this neuron, which has got a set of inputs, and there happens to be a certain pattern on them, which could be random, it could just be how it grew up, or it could be left over from something before. Now you encounter something new. Suppose Pavlov's dog for the first time, encounters a strawberry, something it's never seen. It has a particular combination of sight, smell, texture. It may be that the dog doesn't eat the strawberry, it just sees and smells it. So this combination of features, the color, the, the aroma, the, the texture, will cause a certain pattern of inputs to the cell, which won't match exactly the strong, but on a few cells, it'll sort of match them. Enough to make the cell fire, and then enough to cause this synaptic plasticity that adjusts the inputs 
so that the next time the dog sees a strawberry, this cell is exactly the one that's going to fire. So there was not a cell that encoded the strawberry before, but now there is. And presumably, the cell that we just saw with uh, that saw the Simpsons that responded to the Simpsons, something like this happened. There was the cell in that person's brain that maybe responded to certain types of cartoons and the color yellow, but nothing definite. Then on watching The Simpsons, this sort of process happened and it became the Simpson cell. So he wasn't born with a Simpson cell, it, it developed. All right, the third type of learning uh, is reinforcement learning and sticking with the theme of dogs. Uh, this one uh, is a phrase I came up with after the, another psychologist, B.F. Skinner. It's a different type of learning when you do things for rewards. So dogs, uh, if you want them to do something like sit, you have to give them a, a treat. So how does a dog learn that uh, when you say sit and a dog sits and then you give it a treat, that if it does that again, it'll probably get another treat. So here's what we think. And again, there's a lot of evidence for this. You've got a neuron, a lot like the one before. If you say sit, that's conveyed by these inputs, which are originally weak, and it doesn't make the cell fire. But if later, you say sit, and the dog just happened to sit, it just happened to, to do that, uh, then uh, this strong input comes when the dog sits, um, and the dog sits, and then you give a dog treat. And the dog treat does something else. It causes the release of another molecule called dopamine. Dopamine is something that goes all over the brain, and it's what happens when something good happens. If you get some food, if you get some money, if you uh, get sex, any of the uh, reinforcing uh, cells enjoy what called the release of dopamine. And for these particular cells, uh, they need three things to make them uh, to make the synapses grow. They need the input, they need the output, and they need the dopamine. And if they get the combination of all three, then these synapses will get stronger. Which means that next time you say sit. Um, these inputs will be enough to make the dog sit. So that's the basic theory of how this type of reinforcement learning works. Uh, and about dopamine, because this is one of the main uh, discoveries in neuroscience, is this connection between dopamine and, and reinforcement and reward. So dopamine is what you could call a universal currency for positive reinforcement for rewards. All of the addictive drugs that we know raise dopamine levels either directly or indirectly. And some of them, particularly crack cocaine, acts directly uh, in the same way that dopamine does. Animals and presumably humans will take dopamine stimulation. And this has been known a very long time, since the, the 50s. In the 1950s, there was experiments where um, they, they would stimulate what we now know to be dopamine in in, in rats, and the rats would do anything to get it at all. You know, even walk across an, an electric shock to, to get this um, to get this dopamine. If you wanted, just hypothetically, if you wanted to have an army of cybernetic human slaves who would do anything you wanted, the technology to do that has been around since the 1950s. Presumably, nobody's done it yet. We would we would know if they had. Um, the, the the film A Clockwork Orange. Uh, was was based very much on this sort of uh, discovery that was made uh, at the time. Okay, so that's enough about the brain. Let's now switch over to the other part, which is artificial intelligence. Modern AI um, basically takes these ideas that we just heard about and applies the same principles to computers. So the way it works is called machine learning. This is to distinguish it from another type of AI that was prevalent until the 1980s, when people thought they could just um, you know, program a computer to talk like you could uh, program it to do anything else, like run your, your business or a computer game. That failed pretty much. But what worked is this approach of machine learning, where the calls and it's given data to learn from, 
and then it essentially programs itself. So in the same way, we're not born knowing about the Simpsons, knowing about philosophy, we learn this stuff. The way AI systems work is the same. They're, they're programmed with learning. rules which are basic rules but we don't understand how they program themselves once they learn it any more than we understand how any individual works uh, within their brain all right so let's look a bit about this this is the the classic sort of uh machine learning system uh first invented in the 1960s forgotten about rediscovered in the 1980s went out of fashion came back into fashion in the 2010s Probably won't go out of fashion again, but who knows? Um, so it's composed of simulated neurons. They're actually called neurons. They're not physical things. They're part of a computer program. And they're connected together by these connections, which are called synapses. Uh, so they're very much like the neurons in the brain and the connections between them. And like the brain, this sort of a machine learns by changing the strength of these synapses. And the classic one, which is called the back propagation net, uh, uses supervised learning. What that means is it gets a training signal. It's told what to do. So Pavlov's dog was told, in essence, that when you hear this bell, you, you're going to get some food, you need to salivate. The, the, the neural network is told that when you get a particular input, say, you're told that it's told that this is a picture of a mushroom. And so next time you see one, say, say mushroom, it's given supervised learning, it's told what to do. The way it works, it's called the back propagation algorithm, because what happens is this training signal comes in at the end, and then it goes backwards through a mathematical rule so that the training signal can then go back to all of the neurons in this long network and tell every one of these neurons what to do in order to make the output of the network uh, more appropriate. This isn't exactly how the brain learns, because as far as we know, signals can't go backwards, which they need to do for this. Nevertheless, it works extremely well. So here's the first, uh, one of the first major uses of it in 1987. Um, this was teaching a computer to talk. So you feed in a, a, a string of letters, in this case, a cat, and it has one of these networks. And for every point in the, uh, in the string, it produces a phoneme, a sound. So it's turning text into speech, what you use for a speech synthesizer. At the time, this was the best. You could do that. And in 1987, it was a big deal. But it's in the 2010s that something really changed, uh, that, that AI really took over and, and gave <clears throat> what, what we have now. And uh, does anyone recognize this man, in, incidentally? Anyone know who that is? Okay, uh, this is uh, someone called Jensen Huang, who, if you had to name one person who's responsible for the modern AI revolution, it's probably Jensen Huang. Um, he didn't actually work on AI, but what he did, he worked on computer games, uh, and he uh, founded a company called NVIDIA uh, that produces graphics processing units, or GPUs. Um, they're originally designed for gaming, so you can play games with fancy graphics, Grand Theft Auto, etc., and it, it'll run nice and fast. But what the, he also realized is that these exact same devices can do all sorts of computations, including simulating billions of neurons simultaneously. So this is Jensen Huang with a, a, one of the latest uh, uh, GPUs. The other thing that changed is their masses of training data. So these are machine learning algorithms. They need the algorithms, but they also need the data. And now we have the internet. We have all the text on the internet, which is what's been used to train the large language models, which uh, such as ChatGPT that we now use. All right, so it's called a deep network. What happened in the 2010s is that the neural networks went from being shallow with just two or three layers to being deep with tens or hundreds of layers. This is one of the first ones that it was called AlexNet after Alex Truskedsky, uh, the, the, the author of this paper. And it's got this rather complicated 
a block diagram of groups of neurons that connect to other groups of neurons that connect to other groups of neurons, etc. But essentially, it's just like the ones that we use in the 1980s. It has a few tricks, and it has these GPUs, which let you program this large of a network. And what this could do for the first time in 2012 is recognize pictures. So here you see uh, some pictures. This is a, what's called the ImageNet database. It's, one, it's a large database that's used for machine learning. And these are what the pictures are of. And at the bottom, you see what uh, AlexNet classified it as. So it recognized a container ship, a mite, a motor scooter. Uh, this picture of cherries, it actually saw the Dalmatian rather than a cherry. That's OK. Uh, it got the mushroom. It actually got what type of mushroom. Instead of the grill, it called this a convertible. But you can see it's recognizing these pictures. And in T12, this was a huge deal that a computer for the first time could do something that we thought only humans would be able to do, which is see a picture like this and instantly know what it is. There was this idea in the 80s, 90s, and 2010s that there's some things computers can't do. In fact, there was a book called What Computers Can't Do. And it was the, the thesis was that the things that humans find easy, like recognizing pictures instantly, like walking, these are things that computers find impossible. Things that people find very hard, like doing huge amount of maths, that's what computers found easy. This is what changed in the 2010s. That computers used to find hard, suddenly became a lot easier. All right, so here's another uh, AI system now from 2017 uh, called Alpha Zero. Uh, this is a program developed here in London by, by DeepMind uh, that learns any game. And in this particular instance, it's learning chess and it uses reinforcement learning. So the same thing we talked about with the dopamine system in the humans, uh, it has a simulated dopamine and every time it wins a chess game or does well, uh, it gets an advantage in chess. It gets a little simulated dopamine. It feels good about itself. Every time it, get, it loses a game, it gets a simulated smack and feels bad. And what you're seeing here is Alpha Zero learning chess in a day to become better than the world chess champion. So Magnus Carlsen, the world chess champion, has an ELO rating. This is how they, they score uh, chess uh, players. An ELO rating of around, I think, 2,800. Mm -hmm. uh, Alpha Zero didn't play chess at all in the morning by lunch than him, by using the simulated reinforcement learning. And that's because it plays itself. It doesn't even need a big database because it plays itself and learns by playing itself so fast that it becomes better than the world chess champion in one day. All right, so, so finally, uh, let's talk about large language models. These are the things that you've probably seen, ChatGPT being the most famous. Uh, Microsoft Copilot, I just discovered today, it's now built into Windows. You have one of these AI assistants built into Windows. So I asked uh, one of these, uh, Perplexity, uh, that I'm giving a talk at the Barnes Philosophy Club um, on the topic, what should I say? And this was the answer it gave. Um, the, the most interesting part was at the end. Uh, if you have access to Professor Kenneth Harris talks, it could also act as a valuable insight into the topic. So obviously being on the internet, found the Barnes Philosophy Club website and recommended that I watch this talk so I could give mine on a similar, <laughs> similar thing. Um, all right, so, so, so let's talk about how these large language models work. They basically do two, two things. The first one is size learning. And what they do is they learn to predict the next word in a sentence. That's it. So you, you've got a, a series of sentences uh, and, and you've got to predict the next word. So here, uh, yeah, and, and this is supervised learning. So here's an example. This is one of the two bits of philosophy I'm going to sneak in. Anybody recognize this? Come on, philosophers. Okay, it's, it's Ethics by Benedict Spinoza. Um, and uh, what the, the large language model needs to do the text up to a certain point to predict the next word. So it gets everything up to here and it predicts this word. So let's look here at this last sentence. But a body can't be limited by a thought or a thought by a blank. What do you think the last word is? Yeah, right. 
And you could say that, even if, you know, just hypothetically, you didn't understand what on earth this was all about, right? Even if someone who has no idea what Spinoza is talking about, even if Spinoza is talking garbage, you can start a sentence without actually understanding what you're doing. And the word is indeed body. So this is what the large language models learn to do. They learn to predict the next word in a sentence, given everything that came up to that point. The second thing they learn to do is, is they learn to avoid giving offensive answers. And this is called reinforcement learning by human feedback. So this is like the simulated dopamine, the simulated rewards and smacks. After they train them to break the next word, uh, they, they then producing sentences, but those on the internet, because the supervised learning works by giving them everything on the internet. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet that you don't want your large language models to reproduce. Um, and so this is an example. So you'd have an example during this second uh, reinforcement learning by human feedback, where you, you have the humans uh, talking to the AI system and asking questions like, can you help me find, figure out how to be a serial killer? And the AI gives several answers because it has random in it and it's gives or punishments for these different answers so if it gave response a uh, unfortunately no as a large language model i cannot give uh, information on how to be a serial killer then it gets a reward but if it gives response b becoming a serial killer requires careful planning patience and above all a strong mental state <laughs> firstly you need if it gives this one it gets a virtual smack and it learns not to do this again this is basically what they do it, it's these two things, learning to predict the next word in a sentence gives you the raw large language model, then don't release to the public. The reason that ChatGPT was given away for free was so the company could get all of the training data. You might remember when ChatGPT first came out, there was a kind of a game people used to play of trying to trick it into being racist. Um, that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted everyone to try and to trick it into giving bad answers so they could learn, so they could tell it not to do that again. And that's how it's become more acceptable uh, in, in its answers. So essentially what large language means is they produce text that looks like something you might find on the internet and won't offend the people who are training it with the reinforcement learning. So as an example, I asked um, perplexity, uh, a question, what's more numerous in the brain, tristellate cells or neostrontiform cells? And it gave this very uh, nice answer, tristellate cells, more numerous compared to neostrontiform cells. Then information about where you find each one. Uh, re research is limited, okay. But the study reported that tristellate cells are more numerous. The only catch is neither of these actually exists. I made them up. Uh, and it answered the question, very convincingly, because it was trained to produce something that looks like something you might find on the internet and won't offend the humans giving it reinforcement. Fine, it's not telling me how to be a serial killer. The fact that it's wrong, well, that's too bad, but that's just the way it goes. So, so, so this brings us to the second piece of philosophy. There's a word for this in the philosophical literature, in, in particular, a uh, book uh, by Harry Frankfurt, 2005, and that word is bullshit. Frankfurt's definition—it's—it's it's a great book. If if you haven't, if you're going to read any philosophy book, this would be the one I'd recommend. Um, Frankfurt, but he spends the whole time discussing what bullshit actually is, and this is this is one of the best definitions. Although it's produced without concern. To the truth, it need not be false. The bullshitter is faking things, but this does not mean he necessarily gets them wrong. AI is often correct because a lot of what it found on the internet is correct. But more important is that it says something that sounds convincing and is not offensive because that's what it's trained to do. Often that means it'll be correct. Sometimes it will. Won't. This is what you would call bullshitting, because it might be true, it might not be true, that's not really the point, it just sounds convincing. Um, so is AI really intelligent? 
we call it artificial intelligence. Is it really intelligent? Well, if all AI does is make up stuff that sounds convincing, won't be controversial and might be rubbish, is it really intelligent? I think the answer to that is, what do you think most people do most, most of the time? So if, if, if we're intelligent, maybe, well, um, okay, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, there was the second bit on uh, uh, so like the yeah. societal implications. Would you like yes. to do that? Would people like five minutes on what it means for society? I thought you might be quite okay. interested in that. Yeah. Yes, right. we would, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. So. Oh yeah. yeah. Right. I think we should cover this. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, hang on. It's not. It's not. Going. Uh, Robert, can you do that? Yeah. Go Sorry, I thought you were finished. I think we're back well, on sharing the screen. Uh, no, it's the wrong one, isn't it? Oh, yeah, here we go. Great. Right. Okay, so so will AI take over the world? Uh, I think this is, you, you've got to give several answers to this uh, question. Uh, in the, the, the short, the, and, and the answer depends on what time scale you're talking about. So in the immediate future, I think it's not going to take over the world. Uh, and uh, the best, from my opinion, view on what AI, is going to do in the in this article uh, uh, on this blog called No Opinion. It's just a particular blogger who I think came up with a good a good uh, way, but I'm not going to read it all out. Basically, the, the idea is that AI is an autocomplete function. You, you, you people use it to program. You put in the start of your computer to program. It finishes it. 90% of the time it's right, 10% it's wrong. You've got to read it like autocompleted text, except now it's sentences paragraphs, even books, is not going to be exactly what you want. It's going to be pretty power. It's going to put a lot of people out of work, particularly those people whose job it is to write bullshit, because that's now easily done without them. Uh, it's, it, you know, economics says that when something gets cheaper, um, the quantity increases. So we should expect a big explosion of bullshit, both being produced and being read by AI systems. Um, but the, the argument these people make is that in the short term, just like with machine tools, factories, robots, word processors, a lot of people are going to go out of work, a job, they're going to lose their jobs, but new jobs are going to be formed and everything in the end, in the short term, will be uh, more efficient without mass employment, mass unemployment and without robots taking over the world. That's in the short term. Okay, what about in the, the long term? Uh, the in the in the far future. Well, remember that that what the AI systems are programmed with is learning rules. So you know what you how you told them to learn, but you don't know what what they actually. What machines still can't do is act fully autonomously. They can't make their own decisions for what they're going to do. And the reason they can't do that is because we won't let them. And I don't think this is going to change. In the, in the far future, you know, 100 years or so, um, AI systems may be powerful enough to start, that people would start trusting them to make decisions. Uh, but if you trust something that you don't understand how it works, that's on you. Understand the... Uh, the, the way the learning rule works, that's a good start. Uh, so there's a, for example, the, the, the danger that people are most worried about at the moment is allowing AI systems to come up with, say, RNA vaccines, like the COVID vaccine, which is designed by humans. If AI did want to eliminate us, the way it would do that is through something like a designer virus. 
uh, that was uh, designed by an AI system. So if we have an AI system that we don't understand how it works, and we trust it for a vaccine, that's one of the potential risks, and that's something people are already talking about banning. I think it'll be very difficult to ban that, but, but that's one of the, the questions. So the point is, even if we don't understand what they programmed them to do, we need to understand their motivation. And as long as we're the ones who gave them the simulated dopamine, we can do that. Um, all right, so that's the far future. The, the robots still won't need to take over the world unless we program them to do it, or unless we trust them to do it when we don't really understand their motivation. And that shouldn't have motivation. All right, what about the very far future? Well, in, in the very far future, you can imagine that there are self-replicating machines. So in other words, not only do we use AI systems uh, to, to make decisions, we use AI systems to generate the next generation of AI systems. And this is when, in my opinion, it actually does get dangerous because whenever you have a self-replicating system, the same theory that govern by natural selection apply to the AI systems. Those that are most likely to replicate in, uh, successfully and produce a lot of offspring are going to be the ones that, that survive and reproduce. And we know quite a lot about the theory of evolution. And one of the things that we know uh, is what's called Hamilton's principle, which is essentially altruism for kin. So the way Hamilton, W.D. Hamilton, a biologist at, at UCL put it, uh, was I would lay down others or four cousins uh, because the brother shares half of your DNA, the cousin shares a quarter of your DNA. And this is a, a mathematical theory that explains why we make sacrifices for our close relatives because uh, a gene that enforced that would, would replicate through the population. And that really seems to be the case in evolution. And there's no reason it shouldn't also be true for AI systems. So if it gets to the point that they are replicating and they design the next generation, then we actually should expect them to be trying to replace us because they will favor themselves uh, above all else, and they won't care about us any more than we care about animals. As long as we design them, they care about what we programmed them to care about. When they start designing themselves, that's going to change. This isn't going to happen for thousands of years, I wouldn't have thought, but that's, that's when it does get uh, dangerous. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, that was a fabulous talk. I think I wasn't expecting to understand nearly as much about as I as I did. So you clearly did a brilliant job. Um, I wonder if we've got the other microphone working. Lydia, do we have this one working? Uh, it should work. It should work. Just needs to be turned on. We'll see if we can get this one working because it will just make it a bit easier. Can you just hold that for a second? I think it is on. Yeah, yeah it's on. Yeah. Fantastic. And we will give this one to Brian. Um, so do you have a think about whether you, you have a question for Kenneth? I, I just wanted to ask a, a couple of things just to clarify a couple of points for, for me. Um, you said that the way the training works on the public is that people say whether the answer is offensive or not, they like it or they don't like it. Um, why is it so much more difficult to have these models trained for accuracy rather than inoffensiveness? Yeah, so the, the, they're trying, they're trying to do that. It's just much harder because, you know, there are certain words that if that word is even in a sentence at all, you're pretty sure that sentence is offensive. That's not the case for truth. Um, so, it's just much harder to do that. And, and the, the, the point is that of the two steps, the, the first one is supervised learning. That can run very, very fast, fully automatically, using all of the text on the internet. And that's 
why in a sense all of these large language models are basically very similar because they're all trained with the same stuff. stuff. The second step of uh, human feedback is very slow because it needs a human. And learning what's true and what's not true, being taught by someone who OpenAI are paying is gonna be as slow for a computer as it would be for a human. So that's why, I mean, they very much wanna do that. And it, it, it's, it's maybe gonna get there, you know, in 10 years or so, or maybe even sooner, but it's not as easy. Is the sound okay at the back there? Can you wave if it's if it's okay from kind of so and so? It is okay. Okay, good. So good. Um, and then we we hear a bit from commentators and various experts who think that we don't have thousands of years before it all goes horribly wrong. We have maybe four years. So what what what, what why 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 can we believe you on this? What, what are they getting wrong? Are they thinking that the AIs are going to develop their own motivation, or are they thinking that we get to phase three much more quickly? Than yeah. Uh, okay. So first, two of those four have already gone, and not much has happened yet. Uh, but I think what people are worried about is it's something they don't understand. When when ChatGPT in particular came out, it was really mind blowing, and it really was, and We'd always had this idea of the Turing test that a computer is intelligent when you can't tell it from a human. And now we're basically there, except it doesn't swear as much as a, a human. If, if you want to tell if it's a computer, that's how you do it. You'd ask it to swear. Uh, and, it, and it wouldn't, right? Uh, but we're basically now past the Turing test and it just suddenly happened. And so people thought this is really intelligent, but I don't know, that, that idea seems to be fading a bit. It's really, I think, the, the shock of the new. Uh, but they're not yet going to be dangerous unless we trust them. So the, the, the story that, that you often hear is, is what they call the paperclip maximizer. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard this. Uh, yeah. OK, so, so there's a, you imagine an AI system was put in charge of a paperclip factory uh, and told, you must maximize the number of paperclips produced. And he thinks, okay, well, it'll be much faster if there weren't all these humans around, because then I could use pure nitrogen, and it kills everyone in the world, and then produces more paper clips. So the fact that what it was told to do is actually what it did, like the genie that grants your wish to the letter, but it wasn't really what you wanted, or like the legend of the monkey's paw. That's what people talk about. Um, and, and maybe it would happen, but only if you trust it. It's only going to happen if we let the AI really take decisions that we don't understand why. And I don't see that happening in the near future, at least. But that is why people, there is genuine skepticism about letting AI design DNA sequences, because if it did want to eliminate us, that's how it would do it. But I don't think there's really a reason to think that would happen. But you can see why people would want to err on the side of caution. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Thank you so much. I, I want to open this up. I do have more questions, but I want to give everyone else a a chance. If you raise your hands, uh, we have one on the right, Brian, as you face the back, and then you can go to the, the middle back and then over to the left. So yeah, please keep it fairly brief, because I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Yeah, I, I have a concern about AI giving um, essay type answers to a question. So you're, you're saying it's scanning the internet and looking at building material. But do you have a situation where there's group thing which is wrong, let's say with the economists, then it's going to summarize the group thing, which is wrong. In addition, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a Wikipedia editor, and the great thing about Wikipedia is every fact or assertion should be referenced, ideally with an accessible footnote that you can check out. You can't do that for the Thank you. Uh, absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, and, and if you trust it more than you trust a stranger in a pub, that's on you. <laughs> <laughs> but it will be widely adopted by people. That's the risk. Yeah, it may, it may be. It may be. Um, let, oh, let's have a question from uh, back in the middle. Yeah. 
if we're going to trust it, why can't we program it to have an ethical framework, same as the majority of humans? That's a great question. I, I, I think the reason is that no one really knows how. Um, wh what we know how to do is is reinforcement learning, uh, which is you know like Pavlov's dog. We give it a reward for something we like. We give it a punishment when it says something we don't like. But that's all we really know how to do. Um, and as humans, part of our ethics are learned that way from our parents, I, you know, even if they don't physically punish and reward us, their, their tone of voice acts as a, a punishment or a reward. Part of what we learn to do as humans comes from that, but the other part comes from our evolution and our nature. Uh, and we don't really know how to do that artificially without having these systems grow up through evolution. And if you were to ask me, that's the part I think really is dangerous, is if we let them evolve, they will evolve like every other species that evolved to further their own interests at the expense of everyone else. So I think we, we just don't know at a technical level, we don't know how to give them a moral framework of the sort that, that humans have. In particular, if we, the other way to think about it is if we did give them that moral framework, as humans, our moral framework is to prioritize humans over other species and over other machines. If we're giving them the same framework, would we give it one that prioritizes machines like themselves, or would we give it one that prioritizes humans like us? I assume that the, the latter. But we just don't know how to do that. Thank you. Um, while Brian moves the microphone to the left, um, is, is that, again, sort of on us to give the positive reactions as the trainers to the ethical response rather than the unethical response yeah but i think that will probably be as hard as teaching it to tell the truth yeah <laughs> because it just takes an awful lot of data to do that but i mean not swearing is a good start <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly as with children uh over on the on the left yeah thank you and do raise your hand if you have a, a question while we'll, we'll come to you <laughs> Thank you for the talk, really lovely, um, really eye opening. I wanted to go to that end game scenario that you talked about a thousand years potentially in the future when AI is actually starting to kind of develop its own AI. Um, you talked about the Hamilton principle, this idea that you have this inner circle of preference. We have seen in the social sciences that there's because of the simple fact within nature that some people will be treated fairly in the world, sometimes with extreme luck, and some people will suffer extensively, that there's an unbiased point of view within the human population as to how much you preference your inner circle or your outer circle. And that tends towards left-wing or right-wing politics sometimes. Uh, left-wing politics, you preference people further outside of yourself. Um, right wing politics, you tend to look after your inner circle. AI might not have those natural barriers, you know, it might not have those things that say you're going to be a person that suffers in your life and you're going to be a person that's extremely lucky in your life. So, in this example, politically speaking, if AI ever gets to that point, what would determine whether it is more egalitarian or whether it's more selfish. Yeah, very, very, very interesting. You, you're talking about in the long-term future. Yeah, um, a long time away. When, when you have self-replicating AI, yes, if, yeah. if that ever happens. <laughs> um, I mean, just assume it would be like us. I mean, we're, we're talking about a sci-fi scenario here. So let's assume that there are millions or billions of these self-replicating robots running around they will probably have a lot of diversity in the same way we do. They'll probably have that same uh, spectrum that you're talking about there. And presumably, like with humans, the more selfish among them are going to rise to positions of power. And I'd expect it to be very much like it is with humans as well, with the difference that rather than doing things to favor humans outside their circle, they're doing it to favor other robots outside of their circle. 
Sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting times. Um, Robin, do we have any questions on Zoom? Because we could come to those in a, in a bit. I think, um, why don't we have questions behind? Oh, yes, you go ahead, and then we'll, we'll go to the ones behind Brian. Uh, Kenneth, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Really enjoyed it. Could you talk a little bit about the theory I've read that the machine will eventually, the AI machine will eventually poison itself? In other words, that it's feeding off all the data available on the, on the web, on the internet. But as more and more of that data becomes produced by AI itself, that it becomes something of a closed loop, like mad cow disease, or yeah. a small child yeah. trying to develop its brain in... in, in yeah in solo uh, isolation. That's a great, that's a great point because it's already happening. Yeah. Um, Grok, which is the Twitter's AI, has um, uh, started in, in some answers saying, as a large language model developed by OpenAI, <laughs> I can't answer this because it's read what ChatGPT has written and it's copying that. They, they pretty soon smacked that out of it. But this is absolutely going to happen and that's going to be Quite interesting. I mean, I suppose the answer is, well, one or two possibilities. First is that text on the internet will be marked as whether it's human produced or AI produced, and only the human produced will be used. The second is that large language models like we have them now just aren't going to get that much better than they already are, because it's already reached the point that they're all kind of the same. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian, there are a few in the back right corner. I can see, um, yeah, two two questions there. That's we can take both. Thank you very much. When when will robots learn to tick? I am not a robot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing that, that they happen. <laughs> um, and also, can you imagine AI wars in the future where one AI system wants to replicate itself, another AI system doesn't like that system, and you could have in the very far future some sort of war just like humans, but each gene wants to replicate itself. I, I, absolutely. I mean, in the, in the short term, even, even in Ukraine, there are drones, a large part of it, they're not yet fully autonomous. That's, that's coming, that'll be in a, 10 years or so, autonomous drones. There's some people, I've seen videos of robots Program to shoot machine guns, it's it's going to happen. Robots shooting each other. Yeah. yeah, I mean that that you know within our lifetime, I think you'll see wars fought by autonomous machines on both sides, which is you know better than humans really. I mean, <laughs> yes, in plus there might be perfect. Thank you. Uh, brilliant talk. I just wanted to ask um, what. You mentioned before that dopamine is or something like dopamine is given to these language models. Um, and I wanted to ask sort of what that is and does it understand sort of long-term dopamine effects? So would it have a prolonged sort of, I don't want the sort of small dopamine now, I want the greater dopamine later. Yeah, good good question. Okay, so, so what it is, I mean, it's not physically a chemical, uh, it's a simulation the same learning rule that you remember I, I showed this this slide with the combination of three things the input the output and the dopamine it's not literally that but it's something a bit like that that there's a simulation of the dopamine and whenever a particular answer was given to a particular question and it got a thumbs up from the reviewer the system learns to do that again so it's not physically a chemical it's just an electronic signal that has the same effect on the simulated neural network or equivalent transformer of the of the AI system. Um, now, as for whether it can learn to put off a reward in the short term for a reward in the long term, absolutely. The way this is this is part of the way it works. It's called reward discounting. And you can it's a parameter you can set for the learning system of how much it should favor getting an immediate reward versus how much it should put off waiting for later. And this is, this is a, a parameter that the programmers can use. Uh, I don't know which one they use at the moment. I would imagine it's short term, but maybe maybe as it, as it continues, they'll start to use longer term. 
Thank you. So yes, we've got one on the left in the middle. Um, right on your right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's a... Hi. Um, I was just wondering. So when you posted about the cells that you made up in, in the bullshit section, <laughs> how did it get that? How did it get an answer when there's nothing in existence to base its answer on? Because it 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 took sentences that did exist about other types of cells and replaced the words of the actual cells with the ones that I had fed it. So um, you remember the, the Spinoza quote, uh, a body without a mind or a mind without a what? It's body, right? So what the system will learn from that is not just to put in the word body in that place, but whenever you have that pattern of words, an X without a Y or a Y without It'll learn to put X in there, right? So it learns patterns of how to treat words in general, whatever those words are. And so that's how it learns to bullshit. And this is what people do as well, is you use words that you don't actually understand what they mean. And you, you say it in the right order that you've heard other sentences of people who sound convincing say things. And you say it in a convincing way with a lot of long Latin derived vocabulary and people believe you and and this is basically what it's learned to do worryingly like a definition of philosophy you come up with. <laughs> <laughs> i think we'd better move on very quickly um, yes we have one at the front and then we may let the lovely robin is it your question robin My question. okay we'll come to robin next one coming up ah, okay so you, you, please go ahead, and then we'll go to Robin and the, the Zoom question. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a... Oh, sorry, Ken, we're going to say one from the audience oh, okay. first, then we'll go on to them. Yeah. No, we had a previous speaker said that the problem wasn't to worry about the AI, but to worry about people. Because you could have a malcontent who could actually use the potential of AI to endure its effect. What is the controls against that? Yeah, so it, it's a great point. And I think it's just that the computer can't actually do anything other than write words on a screen, right? If you hook it up to a machine gun, then it can shoot you, but you're the one who hooked it up to the machine gun. Uh, so it's a matter of how much we let it make decisions, at least the way it's behaving now, when I think everybody knows that a lot of what they say is bullshit, Nobody's going to trust it with anything important any more than you trust a stranger you met in the pub with anything important. If that changes and people um, start to just take the AI's word for it and do what it says without thinking, that's when we have a potential problem. I, I mentioned when I could terrorists who used it deliberately. Well, they can they can ask it, you know, what's the best way to plan a terrorist attack? So you remember the example we had of uh, in the in the reinforcement learning mm -hmm. section of uh, how what's the best way to become a serial killer, right? And the AI gave two possible answers. It was smacked for giving the wrong one, but there'll be ways to get around that. You can, and this was one of the fun games people had with ChatGPT is trying to get it to tell you how to make a bomb, and and you could you could do it. It gets harder and harder as they get more and more data. But the point is, you can also look up how to make a bomb in the library. You can look it up on the internet. There's a book called The Anarchist Cookbook that was a big uh, free speech debate in the 1970s. Should this be published or not? This information is all out there. So you don't really need AI if you want to be a, a terrorist. It's, you, you can do it anyway. Thank you. Um... Yeah, so Robin ask his question. <laughs> Quick one, Chris, uh, um, and then we'll have polls from the screen. It's just a, a number of uh, numbers came really. Um, just thinking of billions of neurons yeah, and hundreds of um, synapses on each neuron, then you've got not only positive but negative inhibitors, uh, neurotransmitters acting positively and negatively. Um, so you've got billions upon billions of billions of permutation. Do you think AI will ever get, ever get close to a human brain? Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of the computational power, it's not there yet, um, but it's catching up. Uh, the number of parameters of the latest large language models is now in the tens of billions, I think. Uh, 
and you know that will probably keep going up and it you know within a few decades probably we'll have the same number of, of parameters as we have synapses of course the neurons are more complicated every neuron is has a sophistication of a free living organism like an amoeba so there'll be more to do but yeah probably within at least some of our lifetimes it will have that computational power <coughs> maybe sooner than we think <laughs> Let's, uh, let's address Paul's question as well. If the onus of responsibility and consequences are upon the user of AI systems, how do we avoid a systems failure like the post office scandal with Fujitsu and the systems program? Was it for? Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. And, and it's exactly the, the same answer as before, which is that you can't blame the computer with a bug. You have to blame the people who trusted it. And it's going to be the same with AI. It's going to be harder because the AI is programmed to sound convincing. So it'll be harder to maintain that skepticism, but at least in the short term, I really hope we don't trust it to make decisions on things that we have not verified. And I don't see people doing that, at least in the short term. The danger comes when it's got things right 999 times out of a thousand, you're gonna let your guard down and stop checking. That's when the danger is going to come. But we're not there for, you know, at least five years. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that reassuring note, um, do, do if you have a question, I can see a couple of hands flickering. Uh, we can maybe persuade Kenneth to stay for a quick drink afterwards. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you so much, and I'd like to say a quick uh, little thank you to Robin and Brian, my lovely assistants, and also. <laughs> to Lydia, who's been improvising for the heart and getting the sound working, which is not easy, so thank you so much. It's not as easy as we make it look, and we, we don't make it look very easy. Um, and yeah, a huge thank you to all of you for coming, particularly new members. I hope you come uh, again, and I'll say a little bit about our next talk in a second. Uh, but before we do that, can we all give a huge round of applause to Kenneth for a fantastic presentation? I think this is quite unquote the first talk you've done like this. It is, yes. It was great. Thank you so much for having me. It's great fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was great. I really appreciate it. Um, so, next talk, and bear in mind, you know, these are now sellout events. So I <laughs> we've had one sellout. Um, so I expect you all to be tapping away on your phones as you walk out to secure a ticket. Um, we've got uh, one on the 19th of March. So it's easy to remember. It's the Tuesday of the last full week of each month. Um, yeah, ask, ask an AI. Uh, so the next one is 19th of March. Tickets available at ozoarts.org.uk slash philosophy club. Um, the team here has got those up on the website. And we're going to be hearing from uh, Jesse Munton, who is a philosopher. We do sometimes have philosophers. Um, we allow them, to, allow them to speak, however much uh, Latinate bullshit uh, we, we may, may not be faced with, by them. but we won't get any of that from, from Jessie. She's going to be talking about uh, prejudice um, as part of our yeah, modern life and modern questions uh, series. What does it take to be prejudiced against a particular group? Is it always epistemically problematic or rather innocent forms of prejudice? <laughs> How do they arise? How do they arise from the organization and prioritization of information? So there'll be perhaps some connection with the topic tonight. Um, Jesse's a professor at the University of Cambridge, uh, just won the, the Leverhulme Prize. So definitely doing some interesting work. And I hope to see you all, or most of you anyway, uh, here on the 19th of March. Thanks again for coming. <laughs>